Good evening, everyone, no matter where you happen to be around the world. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. I'm the resident naturalist with Explore.org. I'm also a former park ranger at Katmai National Park, home of the world famous bear camps. And co-hosting this play-by-play -play this evening is Ranger Naomi Boak, who's at Brooks River Station there this summer. Naomi, great to speak with you and thanks for being here tonight. Oh, great to be here. Um, it's been a beautiful day here at Brooks and um, always like talking bears with you. Yeah, so neither uh, Naomi or I are at uh, the falls right now, which is the live view that we're, you're seeing where we're logged in remotely, even though Naomi is at the river uh, to talk with me in this forum that she's she has to be inside on her computer. But we that gives us some advantages. Uh, for instance, we can toggle to different webcams. We can go down river to our river watch camera from time to time. We'll also be taking a look at uh, the riffles camera to see different bear activity on different parts of the river. Each one of those cameras uh, gives us a, a different perspective on the river, uh, an, an idea of maybe what the different bears are doing and how they're making a living. I understand, however, that you know maybe many of you could be new to the bear cams and are wondering just where uh, they are. So let's uh, take a quick tour on Google Earth here and we'll zoom into Katmai National Park. Katmai National Park in Brooks River is about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. Brooks River is about a mile and a half long in oh. between two lakes and the falls is about at the halfway mark. And along with the National Park Service, Explore.org uh, streams and maintains several webcams along Brooks River from the falls downstream. The signal from those cameras is relayed wirelessly to two radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain. It sort of popped up and over and across the mountain. And then that, those repeaters send the signal to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away. And then from there, it gets uploaded to the rest of the internet. So it's a pretty remote spot overall, um, but we are uh, really, uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to share this experience with everybody. Again, we'll be looking at the Brooks Falls camera on the left side of the screen at world famous Brooks Falls. And then the Riffles camera about a hundred yards downstream of the falls itself. And we'll also uh, take a look at that river watch camera, which covers a great deal of the lower river area. Naomi and I will also try to answer a couple of viewer questions that we have uh, uh, queued up for ourselves today. And those were submitted in advance using the Ask Your Bear Cam question page. You can find a link to that in the live, uh, or excuse me, in the, uh, the featured comment uh, below the live camera feed. So just scroll down there if you want to submit questions in advance. We'll do our best to try to answer as many of those as possible during our live events. But perhaps, uh, Naomi, let's get back to uh, the falls. We're seeing a lot of salmon there uh, right now, but that hasn't been the case over the last uh, several days, has it? No, we've had very little salmon. And um, it's interesting because I spent some time um, on the lower river on the bridge this afternoon, I'd say around 3 o'clock, and saw the salmon down there. Um, and I knew that, oh dear, they're going to be a lot of salmon for our play-by-play -play and not very many bears. And why is that, Mike? It's, it's a little counterintuitive when there are a lot of salmon at the falls at any one point in time, then often there are fewer bears because the bears get their fill. They don't have to work very hard for their meals. They don't have to stick around. They don't have to compete for fishing spots as as much as they would if there were fewer salmon so they go they get their fill they rest in the forest and then they come back when they're hungry they have quite an appetite of course having to eat a year's worth of food in fewer than six months to survive but when there's a lot of fish around they easily get their fill and uh, we for that reason we see fewer bears at the falls that was quite a contrast to what we were seeing this morning where there was uh you know i, I think at one point in time just on the falls cam view i was seeing as many as as 15 bears within the falls camps line of sight and that was just like within like a 20 yard corridor uh, upstream and downstream of the lip of the falls so a lot of bears packed into that uh that small area yeah i i was hearing from visitors that um that there were you know they were counting 
like around around 30 bears there today and um it's those are high numbers um not quite as high as what we saw last week mike when we had our bear palooza but there are a lot of bears here and also to know that uh tammy who has our bear monitor she um she monitors the bears she's the one who gives the bears their numbers she was uh she has a monitoring station along the river and the other day she counted 57 bears not counting cubs that's a lot of bears <laughs> and that makes her job uh, kind of difficult too you're trying to keep track of all of those bears and identify them for um for the monitoring records yeah it is not an, an, an easy task so the bear monitoring job uh, can be quite enjoyable um, but it can also be quite challenging at times and you know the bear on the lip of the falls naomi do you recognize that bear i know our view is a little bit pixelated if you're watching at home you probably have a clearer image um, than we do I, I it's i it's very hard for me because the image is so pixelated um i have some guess i would say of a large female this is definitely a healthy bear and when you're looking at you know the relative um you know fitness of the bear you know throughout the summertime and how well prepared it's going to be for hibernation you can all, often look at just like their stomach if their stomach is hanging really low, that means that they're putting on a lot of fat reserves. And several of the bears in the area right now are quite um, well prepared for hibernation, even though it is already uh, July. We'll take a look at a video uh, later in the broadcast that shows like a skinnier bear, um, not abnormally skinny for this time of the year, but certainly a skinnier bear. So that'll help uh, uh, you to kind of gauge some of the, the body size differences between um, these these different animals. This bear on the lip of the waterfall, though, is is quite skilled, and it's been successful over the past you know half hour or so. When I've been trying to watch in preparation for this broadcast, the lip of the falls is one of those preferred fishing spots for a lot of bears. Some bears choose not to fish there, but uh, like this bear is doing and being successful right now, you really it's it's a successful spot when a lot of salmon are jumping because you can wait for the fish to come right to you. Now, I, I think I can recognize one, well, I probably can recognize two bears there, but um, uh, towards the other side of the falls, between those two rocks, I suspect that's bear eight, nine backpack. He has very distinctive colors this time of year. I sort of call it like he wears pants because his back half is darker than his um, light half. So I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna take a guess because He's my spirit bear, and I think that's who it is. Yes, I think that is correct. And a lot of our, um, you know, the, of the big adult males that we see at the river, most of them return to Brooks Falls each year. And this is number 89. This is a photo of him on uh, July 2nd of this year. So fairly distinctive with like a lighter brown uh, front part of his body, especially towards his head and his neck. But like you were saying, Naomi, he had definitely seems like he has darker pants. So that's um, the, the two-toned characteristic is uh, fairly consistent with, um, with number 89 uh, backpack. I think we're also uh, have the opportunity um, uh, later in the broadcast to maybe focus on in on some of these, um, these different bears at the falls and introduce those characters. So while we're looking at this bear on the lip of the falls, uh, Naomi, one person was wondering, you know, can you remind us how the bears get their numbers? I think, uh, you know, they're, they get their names and numbers when they're young often, but uh, this person, Mona, says, I, I find it funny that 747 has a number and has grown to be so big. So do you want to explain a little bit more about that process, how the bears receive uh, their identification numbers? Well, you cheated, Mike. You changed that bear's number to 747 when he got bigger, right? No. I'm oh, did I? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so what happens is when um, a uh, cub is emancipated from its mother um, during that year, if it is seen by a bear monitor three times um, in um, July or September, then that bear, uh, as a subadult, gets a number. And um, also, if an adult bear or a subadult bear comes along and has never been seen before by the bear monitor, um, that bear will also get a number. 
um, like bear 147 that we have an adult bear that we have been seeing this year. Um, he got his number last year. He was first observed in July 2020. And um, they're um, not sequential, but um, th uh, this year there'll be uh, bears in the 200s. Next year, there'll be bears in the 300s. And um, because there are already bears with those numbers in the 200s, it's not like we get, we fill up 200 bears a year or 100 bears per year. Um, so uh, uh, Boyer 747 got his number when he was first observed as a subadult and uh, just grew into his number. Yeah, it was a bit prophetic in that sense. And we'll, I think we'll have an opportunity to maybe introduce um, 747 in a little bit. But look at the skill of this bear on the lip of the waterfall, standing there waiting for the salmon uh, to jump right into its mouth. And again, those are four to eight pound salmon. Sockeye salmon are the majority of the uh, salmon that we see swimming in Brooks River, the vast majority, something like 99% of the salmon that enter Brooks River each year to spawn or to migrate through our our sockeye salmon. So not an easy catch, but for the bears fishing at the waterfall right now, I think this is really a great opportunity for them to take advantage of um, this bounty of food that has arrived today because there was a lot more competition between um, these bears earlier. Naomi, you mentioned number 89 backpack. Um, he's eating a fish near the boulders there. He's an adult male. He's in his teens right now. He was born in 2006. Uh, but there's another bear on the far side who's also a uh, easily recognizable um, bear here yes. at, at Brooks River um, because he has a, a prominent um, wound on his uh, muzzle. Uh, let's uh, take a look uh, at, at number 32 chunk here. Chunk is a big male. And he was late to uh, the party this year. We usually see him in May and June, and he only arrived last week, but I think that wound may uh, tell us a little bit of a story about why he is so late. Yeah, we're not really sure, you know, exactly how 32 Chunk got that big wound across his muzzle. I mean, it's a substantial wound. It didn't look particularly fresh when he arrived, although it hadn't really started to heal very much, but it wasn't bleeding or anything like that. So uh, in the early in the season, adult males like number 32, um, like, like number 89, who's um, on the, the far side of the falls right now, they have to compete for the limited mating opportunities available to them. Not all female bears will go into estrus each year or go into what you would consider like their version of heat. Um, like if you're thinking from a dog's perspective, so uh, if a mother bear is caring for cubs, then she doesn't go into estrus. She's not receptive to mating. Uh, and that means that there's a lot of competition between adult males for the remaining females that might be in estrus. And I, I suspect that when we see these bears coming back to the river in early summer with a lot of wounds on their face and their neck, uh, then it's definitely um, something that happens during the mating season where these bears are competing for um, access to adult females. Also this year, um, we didn't have a lot of uh, single females returning to the river. Um, some, some more have arrived um, in the last week or two. Um, so some that it may be that um, we saw a lot of mating season going on here, but um, I, I suspect there was uh, more going on away from the river that we did not know about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the river gives us a great opportunity to observe the behavior of these bears while they're here. We get to know a lot about what Backpack does at the river, where he likes to fish, for instance, which bears he will uh, displace from fishing spots and which bears he'll defer fishing spots too. But away from the river, uh, you know, a lot of those similar dynamics uh, happen, but, you know, with the forest surrounding Brooks River, it's just too difficult. And their home ranges are too great for us to really understand all of the storylines that are going on. But we can make some educated guesses, for instance. Now, getting a look at not only number 89 on the left, but number 32, Chunk, on the far side. He'll be a very recognizable bear for, uh, I think, 
for the for the rest of the summer because of that muzzle scar and or wound and that'll scar over and next year i bet he'll come back and it'll be a noticeable scar for him bears are very tough they're very resilient animals though i don't uh anticipate that that muzzle wound that he has will hinder him really in in much of a, st a substantial way for him to not be able to to make a living And we have a, a few volunteer camera operators that are working the cameras this evening and giving us uh, these tremendous views of the bear. So thanks to them and all their hard work. There's actually a, a large army of volunteer camera operators and we're thankful for their, their time um, to drive the bear cams and help to, in a sense, curate um, this experience. But look at Naomi, look at, you know, looking at, excuse me, <laughs> looking at, uh, chunk over here now. I mean, you can see that that muzzle wound isn't the only wound that he has. He has several on his forehead, across the top of his head, in between his ears. And it seems like everything froze for me. All right, so if you can still hear me, apologize for that. Looks like some things have frozen from uh, my perspective here. We'll try to work out some of those technical details as necessary. Let's see if we cut back the Brooks Falls here, whether... All right. Well, we're still frozen for the moment, folks. <laughs> so please uh, stand by while we try to figure this out. It looks like we're experiencing not uh, a problem on my end of things. My end of things is working fine, but it um, looks like maybe we dropped the, the bear cam signal out of Brooks camp for just a little bit. So uh, our camera operators are going to work to get that back in the meantime. Naomi, are you still with me right now? No. Okay. That means that uh, we'll wait for Naomi to come back into the broadcast before we move on. All right, thanks for hanging out with us as we troubleshoot these uh, technical difficulties here. Uh, as we're, I wanna uh, explore a, a clip or, or a scene that we saw, a situation we saw earlier today on the bear cams. And I wanna wait for uh, Ranger Naomi to come back because I'm uh, looking forward to hearing her insight on this. Um, so if our bear cams don't come back, but Naomi can, then we'll go ahead and and cut to that for the time being. But right now, my webcams are frozen, as are yours at home. So we're going to uh, stand by here for just a few more minutes. Thanks for your patience.
All right, and it looks like we experienced a perhaps a power outage in the uh, big town in King Salmon, again, about 30 miles outside. Uh, are we back? Turn off my camera. All right. Do you hear me, Naomi? Hi. I'm on. Are we? Are we I do on oh. IPS Wi-Fi, and I don't. I would like to switch back to Explore because this is. I don't. I'm not sure how this is going to go. Yeah, you're quite broken. Um, why don't we wait a few minutes? I'd rather have. Let you me have switch back. To, I'll, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm going to switch back to NPS. I mean, back to Explore Wi-Fi. Be back in a second. Okay.
Aha. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be back. All right. Well, uh, you're yeah, not sure what that is. We're not streaming live now. Um, so I had restarted. The, right. I yeah. Right. right. Uh, you know, I, the cameras crashed for whatever reason. And then, um, and then the vMix interface that I'm using also crashed. So everything sort of crashed yeah. at the same time. Yeah, and I couldn't get Explore Wi-Fi, so I'm on, <coughs> and I'm on NPS Wi-Fi on my phone. Okay, so um, that's Candace, how, what that's did you say? I, I couldn't really hear you. Oh, yeah, I just figured out when my mic wasn't working, because it, for some reason, um, wasn't, uh, working. Um, oh weird. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that was a comp that was just a perfect storm of events. A little power outage in King Salmon took down the whole router and the Brooks Falls High computer didn't come back until long after it connect. And then VMix didn't like when I was trying to reset the camera sources. Either way, you should be good to go. I'm gonna mute myself so that I can't hear you more. But um, yeah, I think you should be okay for now. Good. All right, awesome. Let me um, let me tell the cam ops before we go ahead and get started here. So I'll send them a quick message. Mike, I'm a huge bear fan, and having you explain things. Is yeah. Yeah. There's a mother and and uh, and some cubs way down there, but I can't quite yeah. tell who they are. All right. Uh, yeah. So Naomi, when we come back, um, you want to just go straight to the grazer thing? We'll introduce. Yeah, I'll do. reintroduce the cams and everything. Um, Here, reintroduce. Hey everyone, Mike Fitz here with explore.org. Um, I'm also with uh, Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. If you stuck with us through those te technical difficulties, thank you very much for your patience. It was about a, a perfect storm of events where we had uh, several issues going on at the same time, all of them kind of out of the control <laughs> of uh, the on-air talent and also out of the out of control of the camera operators and the uh, website technicians of explore.org but we were able to to figure it out and get back with you overall so naomi and i are going to be sticking with you through uh, at least uh, another half hour or so we're going to be looking at not only bears at brooks falls but we'll also um, you know take a look at different parts of the river from time to time depending on what the action is doing to look at maybe the riffles area about 100 yards downstream of the falls maybe even go farther down river to look at the uh, the lower river area. This is uh, about you know three quarters of a mile downstream of Brooks Falls. A bit of a hazy day there, uh, Naomi. Is that from um, wildfire smoke in a different part of the world? Um, it could be. Um, it was very clear and sunny today, um, but we are expecting rain tomorrow, so it could be weather finding its way to us. I see. Okay. But and there's been. You know, so much bear activity on the river today. Uh, not only, you know, a lot of great stuff happening right now, but Naomi and I did want to take a few minutes uh, during this broadcast to address uh, a situation that happened earlier in the day. And um, so I'm going to cut to that video. We're going to take our time discussing it and try to break it down for you uh, because uh, a lot of people had questions about what went on and why things happened. We're not going to be able to answer all of those questions, but we're going to try to give you our uh, best um, insight into that that situation. Now, I want to give everyone a little bit of a warning. Um, when people witnessed it live, it did trigger a lot of strong emotions, and a lot of uh, and a lot of people who saw it. There's no blood or gore um, in that sense, but it is a very violent clip. So, I do want to give you a word of warning. Um, if you you know witnessed it earlier today and and you know you didn't like it, then maybe just take a break for um, ten or fifteen minutes and come back and join us later. But I'm gonna. Uh, queue up that video here and 
we're going to start kind of right at the beginning here. Well, from time to time, we'll we'll uh, play and then we'll pause um, to focus on different aspects of like the bear behavior here. But Naomi, this is you know kind of what we saw this morning. A typical scene at Brooks Falls: a lot of bears fishing downstream of the falls. We didn't have nearly as many salmon at the waterfall at the time, so bears really had to compete for space. They had to spend a lot more time um, fishing. So when you look at this view, I mean, there's really nothing abnormal about it. Uh, but what I want everyone to focus on are the bears on the left-hand side of the screen. So you'll see uh, on top of the waterfall on the left-hand side, a mother bear, that's number 128 Grazer. She's an experienced mom. She has come to Brooks River every year of her life, as far as we know. Uh, she was born in uh, 2005, and she's caring for two yearlings that are behind her. And then also there's a very small bear on the uh right below her at the base of the waterfall and let's take a look at what that small bear does next because that will give us a little bit of insight into perhaps its motivation and its willingness to take risk so right here you know it's it's like really not anything too abnormal happens and i'll pause it again here naomi we saw this bear you know, kind of reach up towards Grazer and her family earlier, trying to take salmon uh, from that family. Uh, and we, sometimes we'll see bears actually try to steal in this manner. And they can sometimes be a little bit more bold because they think that that gap of the waterfall um, can protect them. Have you seen other bears, you know, utilize that sort of a stealing technique in that spot? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, it's a it's a very common thing to see. It's, and we've seen we've seen that a, a bunch this year because we the salmon have been so late. There haven't been that many salmon. And this um, scavenging and s stealing technique is is been used a lot all over the river. But this particular spot is used by um, a number of bears to try and get salmon from those successful bears on the lip of the falls. And Grazer is a really skilled angler on the lip of the falls, like that bear we were seeing at the beginning of the broadcast, uh, you know, really skilled there. So catches a lot of fish in that location. And uh, her, her yearlings, they're in her, their second summer. They're also uh, very hungry. And the way this dynamic between this family often ends up playing out is that, uh, you know, the, the cubs, or those yearlings will try to take food away uh, from mom. But mom really isn't uh, that um, you know, keen on sharing her food. So what she ends up doing more than anything is just tolerating her cubs taking food away from her. If they can rip a piece of food away from Grazer, then she'll let them do it, but she's not necessarily sharing. She's also very hungry in that sense. So we see this family kind of competing repeatedly over the same fish that mom catches. And I think that uh, really sort of like puts all of these bears on edge. But this young bear below the waterfall, again, this is, we've had this video pause for a little bit. Um, so we'll, we'll play it here. But that young bear actually was able to take some fish from this bear family earlier in the day. So it felt maybe a little emboldened um, to try it again. So you can see, you know, mom trying to eat some fish, the young bear below, um, the, we think is a young independent sub adult. I, it's possible, I'll pause it again, it's uh, possible, Naomi, that this could be like a yearling of another bear, another mother that was nearby, maybe not one that was not paying attention, but I'm, I'm just not sure. I don't know if you have a better idea on, you know, the identity of that animal, whether um, that young bear is an independent, like two and a half year old or three and a half year old. It is very small if it is a, a two and a half year old or three and a half year old. Yeah, I'm like you. I, I don't know. Um, the only thing I could say was I did see another adult bear on top of the falls. And that um, and there's just a possibility that that could be a cub that um, had um, not had been OK around 128 Grazer and had this one successful steal from her and now has become emboldened. But yes, it, it's a small bear, either a very young sub-adult or a cub. And really taking a risk here, I mean, 128 Grazer, if you're not familiar with her, is uh, one of the more defensive bears on the river. So better look at her standing in the riffles, so 100 yards downstream of the falls. I took this picture um, uh, nine days ago on July 
10. So uh, she's recognizable, very blonde overall, fairly large blonde ears, uh, and you know, uh, it's a distinctive face on her as well. So she's a defensive mother. This um, that cub or that yearling uh, was really taking a risk here, getting so so close to this very defensive mother bear, but feeling perhaps that the waterfall uh, provides it a bit of protection. Now, right here is an interesting moment because I uh, one of the year one of Grazer's yearlings actually moves behind her. The second one is also behind her as well. But the the yearling on the left, Naomi, actually has the fish at this moment in time. So took that fish away from uh, 128, moving behind. You can see that bear below the falls though has recognized where the fish has gone and is looking in that direction. We'll see it actually sort of reach up in that direction. And, uh, and then all of a sudden mom, she uh, is really on edge at this point. She ends up disciplining her cub. Uh, for some reason that cub really, maybe uh, that yearling, uh, for some reason, kind of triggered her in just that that moment in time. Maybe it roared. Maybe it kind of scratched her. Um, and maybe she didn't like her two yearlings fighting behind her when she was in that vulnerable position. But she turns around. She disciplines that cub. She pins it down, you know, firmly but gently, and says, "Hey, that's enough, child. You need to settle down in this moment." And that looks like it gives that um, that smaller bear an opportunity to reach up and try to reach in from from some for some scraps. And uh, let's uh, play this forward and see just what happens next. So it's reaching in there. It's really trying to get uh, to those to that to that salmon, and then Grazer just grabs it by the scruff of its neck. And this, you know, kind of goes on for uh, a long time, maybe uh, you know, close to 30, 45 seconds. We'll play the whole thing here. But uh, Naomi, she's really given uh, that that young bear, um, you know, uh, the work over. Yeah, and the. The young bear, I mean, it's trying to escape. I mean, the only thing it can do is back off, um, uh, but she's not letting go. Yeah, she's not. And I'm going to try to back the, um, just a little bit to the beginning of that situation where she grabs on, just so we can revisit that one more time. Because we see, um, again, the yearling with the fish on the left-hand side. We see... Uh, mother turn around discipline her cub because she's kind of on edge and nervous in that situation and then that younger bear reach up once again and when it's reaching up it actually is trying to it seems like trying to climb the waterfall and i wonder if this instance if 128 you know is not only feeling defensive of the fish but maybe thinks that that, that other bear is a threat to her cubs and that could um you know motivate her to intensify uh, the attack, but for whatever reason, I mean, that young bear was vulnerable in that moment, and you can see the strength of Grazer. Um, she's she's not a small girl. I mean, she's a she's a big adult female, uh, easily could weigh 500 pounds at this time of the year. So grabbing it, trying to pull that other bear up to the top of the waterfall, really um, uh, mauling it. I guess is the um, the best word for that. And then also Naomi, we see that bear trying to push backwards, resist Grazer's um, strength. And that that resistance pushing off of the waterfall, I wonder if that also, uh, you know, Grazer sensed that and was um, not willing to let go in that instance because she was feeling that that force or that resistance. I'm not sure, but um, that's another thought that I had. Well, it's like one of those Chinese puzzles in that, you know, the more you pull, the tighter it gets. And um, I feel like some of that was going on and i i do agree that i think she was being <clears throat> excuse me defensive about um her not just the fish but her cubs because when this started one of the cubs was on the other side and um it's just you know again it looks like a perfect storm and the other thing that i'm looking at in this picture is the bear to the left of grazer's cubs and I don't know, Mike, do you have a sense of relative size of that bear? Yeah, that's uh, either a small adult female or maybe an older independent subadult bear. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, okay. But yeah, but it, it definitely is not a, a large bear. Obviously, 128 doesn't perceive that other bear to be a threat. And, and actually, as we play this forward, you'll see one of the cubs kind of lower its head and, and kind of like squat its paw in the water towards um, that that other bear. So the whole family at this moment is really kind of feeling um, defensive. One other important thing to note, Naomi, is where um, Grazer has grabbed this other bear. 
Uh, it may look like it's that other bear's really kind of in a, in a vulnerable spot, but it's, it's by the scruff of its, uh, its uh, grazer has it by the scruff of its neck and the skin there is really loose. Um, so unlike people, uh, you know, bears are, are like dogs or cats and they, they have, um, you know, loose skin, you know, mothers, but you know, can pick up their puppies, for instance, you know, we, we see, um, wolves, wolf moms pick up their, um, their pups in this way. We see wild cats. Uh, do that as well. So the skin is there. It's fairly loose. It gives the bears in this instance, maybe a little bit of protection where if this was a human in this situation, then our skin would have been ripped probably clean off. Uh, so, so this bear is a little bit lucky in that sense. Actually, at this moment in time, I was wondering whether she had it by the ear and whether um, it was going to tear its ear off. Oh, that was my reaction too, because we've seen um, a number of bear fights that result in and bears losing their ears. It's very so this, tough to watch this. Yeah, I mean, this is a particularly intense, um, you know, fight between two bears, if you want to call it a fight. I mean, uh, she eventually drops the younger bear, it slides off of the waterfall, lands on its back. Uh, but the, it's, it doesn't seem to be really that much worse for wear given the circumstances. I mean, I'm sure it experienced uh, a lot of pain in that situation, probably fright as well. Uh, you know, if you're being attacked like that, you're overpowered by a larger opponent. I mean, that could be a, a, an extremely scary situation for, um, for, you know, a young bear. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to deny that they can't feel those emotions. Um, I think they, they probably can. So, I mean, that bear, was was in a real tough spot overall uh but it's it's behavior right after this is i think very telling because it almost gets down into the water and it's you know facing off against that that uh, that larger bear that really doesn't have, want anything to do with it um but it's also uh you know kind of just looking around like hey is there fish here right now <laughs> so <laughs> so they you know you see the behavior of that that young bear um right after let's back that up and just watch it one more time for uh, right after the moment where it gets dropped off of the waterfall here so she uh, has it you know it, it seems like uh, she you know she's not willing to push the interaction any further her cubs are safe she drops it it lands on its back it moves away and all of a sudden it's like oh my gosh is there is there fish here maybe i'm reading a little bit more into this than um than other people see but yeah really kind of paying attention to the water itself we don't see any blood or anything running down the side we don't see any pieces of missing skin overall no, no obvious damage to its ear so this bear fared um well considering the circumstances definitely a situation that was difficult um to watch and difficult to witness for a lot of people but uh, naomi for me it really does highlight the risks that some of these bears are willing to go when they happen to feel uh, like, well, they're, they're hungry and they're not, they're not getting their fill and they can't compete for those, uh, those preferred fishing spots, uh, at Brooks Falls. Well, I, I, I think also this young bear had the wrong feedback because it initially was able to steal some fish from 128. So thought it could do it again. I mean, that's how we all learn, right? We get, be, we're successful at something. And so we try it again. And I think that's, that's part of the issue. Now this young bear got another lesson. Um, yeah, and it's unlikely and to repeat that mistake. Uh, well, almost certainly if this young bear earlier in the day hadn't been able to be successful stealing fish from grazer just like this, if it had been on top of the waterfall and she would have charged it and kind of ran it off, then it wouldn't have tried it again. I mean, it would have learned its lesson, but it had that positive, positive reinforcement. So it tried again and bears have such good memories and anything that motivates or the thing that really kind of motivates them more than anything else at this time of the year is access to food. Um, so yeah. it took a risk. Um, it got rewarded once, took that risk again. And it found out that, you know, sometimes it's, it's not worth it to play with fire. And I don't think we'll see this bear repeat that mistake again. Yeah. And I, I also wonder, uh, again, um, since I wasn't at the falls and I didn't witness this in person, would love to um, look at some of the um, 
closer images of that young bear afterwards um, because I, I still have a question in my mind, is that 806's yearling? Because in some ways it would make sense in the fact that that young, that bear uh, had positive feedback the other day with Grazer when she didn't fully uh, attack 806's cub when it was on on the lip of the falls. It gave that young bear a pass. So it just makes, it makes me wonder, could it be that young bear that um, had two instances where he felt, oh, I can do this with 128. So um, when you and I have a chance and can get a better image and maybe show that to a bear monitor um, to figure out just who that young bear was. And I also wonder who the bear on the, on the top of the falls was next to Grazer, um, wondering if that possibly could have been 806. 806 um, does tend to go away from her cub. She doesn't stick right with it the way Grazer does with hers. So just, I'm raising this as a question. I don't know. Yeah, we there. There's several unanswered questions about this, and we'll likely never know. This is um, number eight hundred six and her yearling, right here from uh, last week, so on July eleventh. Um, eight hundred six is also a bear that fishes the lip of the falls, and so we'll see her up there. She can be a little feisty in that location. Her yearling has shown um, a tendency to be feisty in that location as well. And then looking at, um, you know, one two eight grazer here, uh, she is famously defensive. One of the perhaps the most defensive mother bear that I have ever had the uh, the opportunity to witness um, on the bear cams or when I'm visiting Brooks River um, in, in person. But Grazer, you know, Naomi, maybe one more final point that we can talk about um, before we wrap up sort of like this section of our broadcast is that she is not, I don't think that situation is Grazer necessarily being a, a greater danger to other bears or to people. I think that was her expressing her defensiveness and the circumstances led to her being, um, you know, prolonging sort of like that attack or mauling on that, that young bear, maybe because uh, she perceived that that other bear was a, uh, uh, you know, a threat to her cubs. Maybe she was on edge because she was hungry and um, that cub had, or excuse me, that, that younger bear had stolen a fish from her earlier. It's it's just so d difficult to say. But Grazer, you know, again, being she's being a bear in this situation, it's difficult to watch. But this is the reality of the bear's world overall. It's one of feast and famine. It's one of of hunger and competition, and uh, you know something that we're certainly going to see. You know, uh, the or have the opportunity to witness on bear cam. Yeah, I, I think you know you and I have both talked about. Um, circumstantial dominance, and in this case, aggression, where circumstance can dictate defensiveness by a bear. Um, we see uh, 856 or 747 go up to another bear to, to make sure they know that they're top dog. But this is, this is a situation where I, I just, a combination of unfortunate events and she just lost it. Now, speaking as a woman, I think that we can make an analogy to mothers who sometimes lose it when their kids have just been too much and they've got too much to do. And, um, and it helps us understand, of course, a bear's circumstances are very different, but I think that should help us understand the amount of pressure that 128 is under when there haven't been a lot of salmon. She's got two cubs to watch over, protect, and feed, and feed herself. And then um, she is very defensive and she goes to extremes that to do all that. Well, I don't know about you, Naomi, but I, I never would have pushed my mother to those limits. I was, I was the perfect child. But you have to maybe you want a second. You want, maybe you want a second opinion on that. Uh, can we talk but to yeah, your, can we talk totally your siblings? Can we talk to your siblings it, or your mother about that? 
I totally agree. It's a difficult, um, you know, it's a difficult life for a mother bear trying to not only, you know, get enough food so you can survive winter hibernation, but making sure that your cubs are protected, making sure uh, that they're well fed, that they learn the, le the lessons that uh, allow them to survive once they become independent. And as we look at these two adult males in the waterfall right now, you know, they don't have those same pressures. Um, you know, uh, Popeye, who is um, in the foreground there, 89 backpack in the background, they uh, were able to, um, you know, they're, they're able to feed um, and, and focus on themselves. And it looks like maybe a family of bears down here. We'll take a look at this, um, you know, mm -hmm. as we kind of wrap up our broadcast here. Let's see. This looks like a divot, actually, um, number 854. Uh, and she's um, an experienced mom as well. Um, we don't see her show nearly the same amount of defensiveness as um, as one to eight grazer. Uh, but you know, mother bears have that potential. Um, they are famously defensive, and and divot's cubs are quite chubby, so she's been providing um, quite well. And you know, we we see her sometimes at the falls, Naomi, but often we we don't see her at the falls. But with this bounty of salmon, I mean, this is opening up opportunities in the situation that we saw earlier today with grazer and that other bear. If there had been that many salmon at the falls at that moment in time, I can I can virtually guarantee that we wouldn't have seen those two bears fight. Yeah, and and look at you know grazers. I mean, um, Divot's cub right just went after a fish itself, and um, I don't know how well anyone can see, but that has to be wall to wall salmon right there, and it's shallow, and cubs like that can take a lunge and perhaps get a fish on their own. Actually, yeah, we saw one of 128's um, yearlings do that. Uh, I think you, maybe you saw that on a play by the last play by play that you did with Ranger Cheryl. Um, yes, so, did. Yeah, so that was, that was really neat to see. This is the age where bears will really try, young bears will try to start and, and, and fend for themselves in a sense. You see them gaining independence throughout um, their second year of life, especially. You see it a little bit with spring cubs, but you certainly start to see it more and more often with these yearlings, these bears that are in their second summer. Uh, and, and Divot is a bear, one of the first bears that I think I may have ever seen at Brooks River. Um, and I first you know, got to know her in 2007. So it's great to see her uh, back at the river being a successful mom. And there's a lot more to her story than that that we don't really necessarily have time to go into. But again, her maternal instincts have really served her well. She's weaned several cubs during her lifetime. And she's giving those um, those yearlings right now the opportunity to explore the falls. She's keeping watch over them. And she's bringing them to the falls kind of in a, in a, in a safer moment when there's a lot of opportunity to scavenge for salmon or maybe even for some of these bears um, to fish without having to compete for um, those really preferred fishing spots. Yeah, I mean, you can look at her. I mean, it's, um, I always talk about how um, female, uh, bears with cubs are, are champion multitaskers and she's she's watching out for her cubs she's looking for fish um, her cubs are eating um, that's that's a really very successful bear And we're seeing that this family too is still a little bit hungry. They're not ignoring any leftovers left along the edge of the river. Uh, the yearlings doing a little bit of their own uh, fishing, different colored yearlings. So maybe that's uh, one way that you can try to identify uh, divot compared to grazer and her cubs. Grazer's cubs are about the same size and they're the same age, but they are closer in coloration, the whole family itself. Uh, but they're great or divot excuse me is not the only bear with um with older cubs like yearlings or two and a half year olds that are different colors though so uh you may see like a number 284 for instance and hers uh number 708 amelia's uh her her cubs also kind of slightly different coloration so uh take a look for that uh Ask your fellow Bear Camp fans who they might think it is. If you're um, if you're wondering, many of them are very good at identifying bears. And the hive mind itself of, of all the thousands and tens of thousands, well, hundreds of thousands and 
millions of bear cam watchers around the world are very good at figuring things out uh, collectively. So we can all, you know, utilize that collective expertise. Now I'm going to um, uh, put a bit of my expertise in here and say that I have been fooled by Divot because Divot comes to the Brooks River as a blonde and she leaves as a brunette. So um, I have been duped in identifying her and her cubs. Um, they want the darker one gets a lot darker and the lighter one stays pretty light. So um, watch for that as the season uh, rolls on. Yeah, the bears are shedding right now. Um, so a lot of those uh, fur patterns that you're seeing today won't be great identifying characteristics later in the summer. So when, uh, you know, a lot of the bears will disperse from Brooks River towards the end of July. They'll fish at other places in August. Many of them will come back to Brooks River in September to scavenge on dead and dying salmon, spawned out salmon. And their, their coloration pattern will be very different than a lot of the scars that we can use to recognize bears earlier in the season are very hard to see. Late in the season, divot comes back, yeah, much darker with that, that fur that grows in. And we're not really sure why, um, you know, bears get, uh, or why, why their fur comes in darker when they grow it in late summer and why when they emerge from hibernation, it tends to be lighter in color. Uh, I don't know, I haven't come across any explanations for that. So I'm still searching, looking for an explanation of that, but it's a phenomenon that happens. And when divot shows up, yeah, in, in late August or September, look for her to have a much uh, darker uh, coat of fur. Well, we're running up on uh, an hour for our play-by-play -play time, uh, Naomi. I know it's kind of late for you. It's definitely late for me here on the East Coast. Uh, I hope uh, you know everyone found our breakdown of the situation between 128 Grazer and that younger bear earlier today enlightening. Um, so again, a lot of unanswered questions about that. It's great to see um, you know a successful mom to conclude our broadcast here, number number eight five four um, divot. Naomi, did you have any? Um, final thoughts or, or um, insights about what our bear cam audience can look forward to over um, their bear watching this evening or going forward into the next week? Well, I think um, we're seeing uh, highs and lows with the amount of salmon. So we'll be seeing a lot of different behaviors. And um, so if we have a lot of salmon caught or we see remnants of salmon. That means that there should be more salmon floating, injured or dead and dying salmon floating down river. So there might be more activity in the lower river with, um, with some of the family groups. Um, I would say um, also, um, you, you guys have been watching a lot of really interesting, interesting bear behavior. And tomorrow afternoon, Mike and I will be in the live chat text. It's not, um, it's not with video, just we're going to be uh, answering your questions. And it starts at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific time, and we'll be there for two hours. And maybe some of the questions that you've had about what you saw or what you thought you saw, uh, what, it, what happened with 128, or any other questions you have, you can ask them tomorrow afternoon in the chat. Yeah, we'll be happy uh, and grateful to, try to have that opportunity to answer your questions. So join us then in the comments right here on the Brooks live chat channel. You can find the comments below the live camera feed. Um, great to see, um, you know, 128 divot here. And I think my final thought to conclude the broadcast is the contrast, like you said, Naomi, of, of the behaviors um, between bears earlier in the day versus what we're seeing right now. We're seeing divot and her yearlings well-fed and relaxed at this moment in time. And that is not something that we saw in the morning and I, uh, with the bears competing for fish at Brooks Falls. And I think that's really the main factor that contributed to that situation with 128 and that other bear. So look for bear cam uh, you know, to give you the opportunity to see how Brooks River changes on a day-to-day -day basis. It's one of the things that keeps you know, me coming back and watching the, the cameras. Uh, every day. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. My co-host today has been Ranger Naomi Boak with Katmai National Park. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, as we like to say at Explore.org, never stop learning. <laughs>